All right, all right, all right. Yes. Okay, ladies. Hello. Can you just look around and look at this beautiful group of women? Praise the Lord. Oh my gosh, you guys are the most beautiful sight to see. I have been praying for you for so long. I really believe that God brought me here to Dallas for such a time as this to know you for this time. Woven is not some project that I've been figuring out in my head and my heart. I really believe that Woven is what God has had in mind. And I feel so lucky to be participating in this ministry that I believe is his, not mine but his. And so I pray that you sense that. And I'm so excited that you're here for the launch night of Woven, the very beginning. Um, I, uh, oh, oh, I can see I can't even talk. Only God knows what he has in mind for Woven, but I believe it's so much more than we could ask or imagine. I fully believe that. And I fully believe it's no accident that you're right here tonight. Look around the women at your table. Just consider God's great love to have put you next to these women who you may know and you may not know. I hope you heard, we are one in Christ Jesus. I believe the church is to be the truest family we're ever a part of. You know, it was fun. I um, didn't know Denny just led us in worship. Denny and Michael Ellis um, in, in bilingual worship, the first song they changed at the last minute. And it was a song that meant a lot to me. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. That is an oldie but a goodie, y'all. In the 90s, my dad was a worship leader for two years in New Mexico. And he sang that song at our church, and it just took me right back to the same little church where God called me his daughter, just seven years old. And the time has gone by so quickly. I don't know when God called you his daughter, or has he? You heard me sound that cry. If, if you don't yet call out to God as your Abba, as your father, as your daddy, man, I pray you don't leave here with, tonight without being able to do that. You just say, yes, God, I need you. Best decision I've ever made. And I know every one of you who knows him would say the very same thing. So we don't have a lot of time together, so I'm going to dive right in with us. But as I mentioned, every month here at Woven, we are going to be talking about a woman in the Bible. And we're going to see that her story is our story. And in so doing, we're going to better understand God's story and how we can better live into his story together. And so I'm actually reading from a Bible tonight that I don't generally read from in situations such as these. I used it in seminary. You likely don't have the paper version with you. It is on your Bible app, though. It's the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. The reason I'm reading from this version with you tonight is because I think it does the best job for this particular story, which I'll go ahead and share with you. We'll be in John chapter 4, talking about a woman who is not assigned a name in the scriptures. She's a Samaritan woman sometimes known as the woman at the well. I believe she is foundational to woven. There's a reason I'm starting with her. And I think the NRSV does the best job of not self-interpreting or adding a bunch of fluff, but it still tells a great story. So I want to give you permission tonight to enjoy the story. You know, the majority of the Old Testament was oral tradition before it was written. These were stories passed on from generation to generation before it was ever written. Jesus told so many stories. Even the pastoral letters were often read for a group of people to hear together. So the majority of the Bible was intended for us to hear in the context of community. How often have we missed that? When I was in fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Ashworth, would have story time in the afternoon. Now, surely in fourth grade, we were old enough to read our own chapter books but it was always a treasured time together. My favorite story was the BFG, The Big Friendly Giant by Roald Dahl. You might know it. She was very expressive. It was so much fun. And so tonight, my hope is that you can enjoy story time in the best story ever told. And my prayer is that you see not only the woman in the story and yourself. My, pray, my prayer is the one that you see the one who this whole story is written about. God gave us his word to show us who he is and how we can walk with him. So hear the word of the Lord as we jump in. I'll read this story for you, and then we'll talk about it. So John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. 
but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one's brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper's already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. Oh, I know that was a lot, 42 verses, but what a great story. There's a reason why I read all 42 verses with you tonight. I know it looks like a lot is happening. There's different plots taking place, but it is actually one story. It all goes together. And I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, or fortunately, we'll see how you think, I don't have time to go through all of this with you. I wish I could. 
I could talk to you for hours about John 4 and still not be done. But I've just got a few minutes so that y'all can talk with one another. But I think that it's God's kindness that this is how it's playing out in our time together. Because my prayer for you is that you leave here hungry for so much more. So much more of God's word. So much more of God himself. So much more of one another. So you'll see on the table, you got these bookmarks. They're two-sided, English on one side, Spanish on the other. This is my gift to you. My challenge to you, an invitation to you, is to stick it right here in John 4 and come back and come back and come back. All month long, we're doing one story. Sit here. Stay with Jesus. You know, um, one commentator said in John 4 that when the city of Samaritans asked Jesus to stay with them, it is as though we are getting to sit and stay with Jesus too. It's as though he stayed with us too. The way that the gospel of John is written, we're right here in the story. And so if you jump into a thread group that you can sign up for right as we leave here, don't leave here tonight without signing up to be a part of a thread group that meets twice a month in different neighborhoods and times that work for you. You can look for those of us in these shirts. We know a lot about it. You can meet thread group leaders in the back. We're going to be going deeper into this story. We're going to be working through these questions and so much more. Figuring out what does this mean for us and what does this mean for others. I invite you into relationship, deeper relationship with God and with one another and with his word. But I do have a few moments with you, so I'll just share a few thoughts to get us started. First off, I do want to tackle something very quickly. I won't spend a long time on this, but um, often we've heard this story and we imagine this woman um, has a very scandalous lifestyle, right? That we often view her as a prostitute, but... The truth of the matter, well, what I would say is the truth of the matter. You can decide where you land. Um, but that is not the way that's always been interpreted. It actually wasn't until the Protestant Reformation that she started being associated with scandal. The church fathers did not interpret this woman that way. And so you can see a lot of resources. We have one in the library here. It's a book called Vindicating the Vixens by a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary named Sand Sandra Glan. Um, but my point is... Um, she presents that it's not likely that she's a prostitute, and she's not the only one who thinks that. There's so many reasons. You know, the death rates were so high. It was very common to be married and have your spouse pass away. Some of you, I know that's your story today. And so it's very possible that her husbands had passed away. You may be familiar in Genesis, the story of Judah and Tamar, okay? Multiple marriages, injustice. This could have happened to her. There's a number of things that could have happened. There's a number of reasons why the man she's living with now is not her husband. So I'm not going to go into that in depth, but I just want to say as you sit in this story yourself this month, consider what this story might mean if that's not her story. Regardless, if she does have a difficult past, but I don't think Jesus brings this up to shame her. I believe he brings it up to say exactly what he said. What you've said is true. You've spoken rightly. He brings her to a place of honesty, of authenticity, this honest relationship with Jesus, he invites us into the very same thing right now. Whatever your past is, whatever your present, whatever your pains, whatever your burdens, you can bring them to him. He already knows. He meets you right there. So consider that this month. The story also, I would say, we've often read about her, but this story is actually not about this woman. The story is about Jesus. So as you sit here this month, look for him come to know him. I challenge you as you sit here this month to circle every time you see that word know, K-N-O-W, or the version of it, new, K-N-E-W. It's all over the place here. I don't know if you caught it. When you come back, circle every time you see that word know or new and just see what the Holy Spirit illuminates for you. It's incredible as you come to know him more. But here's what happens. Jesus surely could have kept on walking with his disciples to get food, He's fully God, but he chose to sit at this well, knowing full well that this woman was going to be here to encounter her. He revealed himself to her when he says, I am. He's not just saying, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. That Greek is the same phrase that God, he says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when God is calling Moses to free his people from slavery in Egypt. And Moses says, when I go, they'll wonder who sent me, and who will I say sent me? And God says, tell them that I am sent you, for I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. Jesus says that very same phrase to this woman. 
You see, when he talks to her about the husbands, it's what enables her to see he's a prophet, but he moves forward and enables her to see he's the Messiah. He's the Christ, the promised Savior. And he knew that as he revealed himself to her, that it wouldn't stop with her. What did she do? Immediately, she runs and tells everybody, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. What is everything we've ever done? Is that not our story? If I tell you everything I've ever done, I'm telling you my story. Come and see a man who told me my story. And many believed because of her story. And they came to see him for themselves and they heard his story. And many more believed. And they said, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves and we know he's truly the savior of the world. Friends, I'm here to tell you, come and get to know the one who is truly the savior of the world. Jump in with us in Woven. Jump in with us in Thread Groups. It's no fancy program. It's no cheesy names. It's, it's the name above all names that I want you to know deeply and to share with others. That's where we're going here with Woven. I pray you'll come with us. So it's interesting, Jesus talking about water and food, there's no accident for that. Look into that more this month. You know, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples about, wake up, look around, the fields are ripe for harvest. Wouldn't you know at that very same moment, the woman is doing just that. She's being sent into the harvest, and the disciples are about to see that for themselves. She's already doing it. Friends, I'm here to tell you the fields are ripe for harvest. We, too, are sent out by the Lord of the harvest, the hope of the nations, the one who's truly the savior of the world. What is he sending you into? The last thing I'll say, there's so much I could say. It's just a few more things that stuck out to me. You might have looked past it in the beginning. It says that when Jesus heard the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, verse 2, it says, although it wasn't Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. Isn't that fascinating? That when Jesus was here himself and he could have baptized, he invited his friends to do his work, to participate in his work. He was offering them real food from the beginning. Y'all, that's us today. He's still inviting us into his work. Don't miss that through this whole chapter. But be encouraged. When Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink. I've got a fun fact for you here. Jesus sitting at the well saying, give me a drink. That's the exact same phrase that Abraham's servant said to Rebecca at the well when he was sent to find a wife for Isaac. In the Old Testament, you'll see a number of things that Robert Alter, the author of The Art of Biblical Narrative, refers to as type scenes. These are scenes that happened often in the scriptures that people were familiar with. So when something happened that was different than normal, you really paid attention to it. You see it as we, Abraham sends for a wife for Isaac, and he says, give me a drink. You see it when Isaac's son Jacob meets Rachel at the well. And so here, Jesus is at the well. This scene was known as a betrothal scene in the Old Testament. John's readers would have known that. We don't necessarily know that today. But this is not a betrothal scene, is it? This is so much more. So I don't know who's here tonight who needs to hear this. Whether it was your husband in the past, the present, or the future, your husband cannot, will not, and should not be what only Jesus can be for you. This woman leaves with so much more than a betrothal. She's had five husbands. She's living with one now who is not her husband. She meets the Savior of the world. She meets the Messiah. Friends, come and meet the Messiah, the hope of the nations, the Savior of the world, the love greater than any possible betrothal. I am a living testimony that Jesus is all we could ever want or desire and so much more. Come and see him. So the last thing I'll leave with you for now I pray you keep going into this more. What's encouraged me most in this season is Jesus asks her for a drink. And then he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Friends, I believe that everything God asks of us, he intends to do for us. But are we asking him? For me, God's brought me to Dallas for such a time as this, and he's assigned me a task that is so much more than me, a task of being used to help 
bring about unity amongst women in Dallas across generations, cultures, language divides. Y'all, I can't do that, but he can. And so as I'm being asked of that, I ask it of him. Lord, do it. Bring us together in your name for your glory. What is he asking of you tonight? And have you asked him? You were never meant to walk alone. There's a reason why Jesus promised us that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. I don't know what you brought in with you tonight, but I pray that you walk out of here hand in hand with your maker, excited for what's ahead, empowered, just as this woman was. Y'all, God used her to spark a revival amongst the whole city of Samaritans. What might he want to do with you for such a time as this? We've got just a little bit of time together. Spend about 10 to 15 minutes, 10 minutes more, if you can, 10 minutes, around your table, and I've got two discussion questions that are come up on the screen. And I want you to talk through them as a table. First, why do you think this is the first story we're learning at Woven? I told you there's a reason. And then second, how do you see your story in this woman's story?